Hey, what's up guys? Matt with the Movement System. Today we're gonna to talk about how I trained for my first half Ironman. We're gonna talk about cycling, running, swimming training, as well as strength training. And then at the end, we're gonna talk about nutrition and equipment that I used. All right, let's go ahead and dive into it. Okay, so to start off with the timeline, I basically did seven months of training to prepare for my Ironman 70.3. Uh, my Ironman 70.3 was in Ohio in July of 2018. That was my first Ironman. So I basically took a full seven months from January all the way through July to build up to that training. So to lay out the timeline here, basically January was a pre-base training phase. So this was basically ramping up to the volume of training that I would need in a base phase. February and March was spent in a base phase doing a lot of longer runs, longer rides, up to three hour long duration rides, mostly on a trainer, as well as longer runs, longer swims to build a base of aerobic conditioning. April, May was a build phase. So in this phase, I really ramped up intensity, started working on my times and took my volume down as I got closer to the race. So June and July was a specialty phase and that's really where I nailed in a lot of race pace type efforts and focused on sports specificity and how I could actually get as fast as possible for the race. So that gives you a timeline through the seven months of training that I did up to the race. During that training, I actually did strength training through the entire time. And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so now we're gonna go discipline through discipline, how I trained for cycling, how I trained for running, how I trained for swimming, and then what strength training I did. So what I did for cycling was I followed the half distance plan on Trainer Road. So if you're not familiar, Trainer Road is a training software that you can follow along with their software as you're riding. So I have a power meter on my bike, which is really helpful, but you can do a Trainer Road program without necessarily having to have a power meter. So the way Trainer Road worked for me, having the Garmin power pedals, I basically did a FTP test at the very start of each phase of training. And functional threshold power is really saying how long you can sustain power for one hour. And that's gonna set the baseline for what your workout intensity is gonna be. And then whenever you pull up a workout on your Trainer Road plan, it's gonna automatically set the intensity of that workout based on your FTP. And this is actually why it was really important that I used January as a pre-build phase. Coming from a relatively deconditioned place in December, I could start to, in January, build up to an appropriate volume so that way I can actually start a plan at a reasonable FTP. But whenever you're starting the half distance plan, you actually have the choice between low volume, mid volume, or high volume plans. I chose the high volume plan, but that probably wasn't the best idea because I really wasn't actually ready for that amount of training volume. Once I was set up on my trainer, I just put the bike on the trainer and then basically set up a laptop in front of me, somewhere that I could see it. And using the software is actually fairly easy. You just pedal along and then whenever the line goes up, you pedal faster or, or increase your resistance. Uh, and then whenever the line goes down, you decrease your resistance. So this is actually, I felt like the easiest way to consistently train at good intensities. You could also do heart rate based training or work with a coach. But for me, the trainer road program actually worked out really well. So most of my training rides were done on the trainer, especially January, February, and March off season in Ohio with it being cold. Uh, a lot of those rides were lower intensity and longer. So I could watch a movie or something like that while riding, uh, especially for the longer two to up to three hour rides. Once you hit the build phase, that's where your intensity really starts going up and your volume goes down. So those rides, instead of being two and a half, three hours of a really long ride become one hour to one and a half hours of a fairly intense ride with harder intervals. During the specialty phase, it's really great if you can go outside to ride. And even if you're not hitting your exact power numbers because you can't follow along with the screen, you can just get outside and actually ride at near race pace and practice turning and practice riding with others. So that way you're comfortable going into a race. If this has been helpful for you so far, make sure you go ahead and hit the like button. Okay, moving on to swimming. I did swimming in a lap pool indoors for really the entire training. And what I did for swimming was just followed workouts actually from Trainer Road again. If you use theirs, it actually worked out well because it would build a calendar and it would offset the cycling and swimming days and it was super easy to follow. It does give you good recommendations for working on kick drills, working on pool drills, and other drills to help you with your swimming technique as you go through. In general, I would try to swim two to three times a week and that would be along with my strength training because I was already at the gym and I could do both at the same time. And as I got closer and closer to the race, swimming became more of a priority and strength training kind of became less of a priority. Okay, so moving on to running, and this is where it gets interesting. 
I actually followed a plan that was very high volume and not what I was uh, used to for running. So January, I really ramped up to a higher volume of running and I was also focused on pushing my pace. I was personally shooting for an hour and a half, half marathon time at the end of my Ironman. And the fastest half marathon I'd really run was about an hour and 40 the year before. So I was constantly pushing 5Ks under 20 minutes, uh, higher volume runs, keeping like a sub eight minute mile pace, and really, really pushing myself January, February, March running. This plan entirely backfired on me. And in March, I had an injury that actually led to a big regression in training, volume, and uh, just overall being able to even run at all. And I really do regret pushing so hard early on in that training. What I learned from that experience is that you really need to treat each phase appropriately. So in a pre-base phase, your goal is really low intensity and just to build up to the volume that you're gonna use in your base phase. So for example, if you're gonna run 15 miles a week in your base phase, then during your pre-base, you need to really start slow and build one to two miles every week or every other week to get up to that actual training volume. And if you haven't been running a whole lot, it actually may be smart to take a really long pre-base phase and really gradually build up that volume. Because again, your body can only handle so much increase in volume in a certain amount of time. So it may take you a few months actually to build up to the training volume that you want to be running at. Also, in the base phase, you don't need to be pushing your race pace. This is where I messed up. Whenever you're in a base phase, the goal is long running, building your aerobic capacity. These should be slower runs and they shouldn't feel like your race type efforts. If you are pushing your race type efforts and doing high volume training, you're kind of setting yourself up for either a plateau once you hit your build phase or an injury. So again, this is experience that I learned from my first half Ironman training that I didn't really learn from whenever I was doing shorter distance sprint and Olympic type training because for shorter distance training, whenever you're only running eight, 10 miles a week, you could push pretty hard. But whenever you're really trying to hit a volume of training that you need for competing in an Ironman, you really need to keep your intensity low enough that you can do that volume of training safely. So moving on to strength training, and this is something that's really important to me as a certified personal trainer, physical therapy student, and strength coach. In general, my goal was base phase of aerobic training would be paired with strength and power training. And that might look like power cleans, squats, RDLs, hip thrusts, fairly higher intensity type strength work at a lower to mid volume. Moving on to the build phase, as my aerobic volume started to decrease and my aerobic intensity started to increase, I wanted to do the opposite with strength. So from a strength training perspective, I wanted to do more muscular endurance work and then focus on higher volume at lower intensity. And then as June and July hit and I was really approaching race type efforts, I wanted to focus on rehab and prehab type work as well as just doing a lower volume of strength training that's not gonna interfere with my aerobic training. Because again, at that point, aerobic's really the priority and you could pick back up the strength training at higher volume off season. So that's the approach that I take to strength training, trying to pair the strength training with the aerobic training that makes the most sense for the goals of that phase. And that's the approach that I take with the athletes that I coach on the movement system endurance team. Okay, so now let's move on to nutrition. And this is something that I definitely could have done better for my first half Ironman training. My goal was around 4,000 calories a day. And I came up with that based on training volume, how many calories I was burning per day, and then also what I was seeing in terms of weight gain and weight loss. I started Ironman training around 205 pounds, and by race day, I was around 175 pounds. I had not intended to lose that much weight. I wanted to race around like 180 to 185, but I actually struggled to keep up the volume of food that I really needed to be eating. So just to give you guys a little example of what one day might've looked like, and this is far from a perfect example, but my goal was around 4,000 calories. So you'll see here, I was eating around 32 to 3,300 most days. I wasn't always hitting my numbers right, so I probably was under on protein a lot of days and could have also used more carbs most days. Fitness Pal, I thought that was a great app. It's pretty easy to use, and if you do wanna be consistent about the protein and the carbs you're hitting, which is really, really important for training, right? So the more consistent you can get with your protein, the more consistent you can get with your carbs, the more consistently you're gonna recover, as well as maintain and build strength. Okay, last, moving on to the equipment that I used. One piece of equipment that was really helpful for me was a training watch. 
I use a Garmin Forerunner 910 XT. This is a older watch. They definitely have better, more intense ones now. I got this off of Facebook Marketplace though for 60 bucks with the heart rate monitor and it worked out really well for me. And really what you need out of a watch is a heart rate monitor and time and if you want to, you can get your metrics from the watch to the computer. This is important for keeping up your pace when you're running. So a watch that will give you time per mile is really important. But other than that, like a lot of the altimeter metrics and intense metrics that the new garments have, I don't think I would personally really use that much. Uh, the only benefit of the new ones is that it automatically syncs with your computer versus this one you have to actually plug in. So that's an extra step uh, from a convenience perspective. But for the most part, you just need a watch that does a decent job. I use this for both running and swimming, and swimming was actually a really big benefit of this watch. So specifically the pace per hundred for swimming was really important to make sure you're actually keeping up the speed and intensity that you need for swimming. The triathlon bike that I used is a Cervelo P1, all stock, so I didn't upgrade any wheels or anything like that. You can use a road bike or you can use a triathlon bike for training. I like the triathlon bike because I personally am really comfortable in an aero position with the elbows down. You can get aero attachments for a road bike, um, but for me, the triathlon bike worked really well. So after all this training, you might be wondering, how did I actually do in the race? Good question. So here are my results. I didn't do as well as I wanted, and it really actually turned out that I was injured for the run and couldn't run at all for the last five miles. Ended up kind of in this limping, jogging type of gallop, and it really wasn't great. Uh, but I learned a lot from the experience. My swim ended up at a 46 minute and 29 seconds which was a little bit slower than I wanted to. I got overwhelmed by all of the people and ended up kind of swimming out to the side a little bit and not really very efficiently. My bike ended up at a two hour and 52 minute bike, which is about 19 miles an hour, which is actually pretty good. I thought that that was reasonable for a non-draft legal race and not having race wheels or anything like that. In terms of the run, I was initially shooting for an hour and a half on that run and it ended up being at two and a half hours. That was again due to that knee injury and having to basically limp through the last five miles of the race. And overall, I ended up with a finish time of six hours and 17 minutes. Not the race that I wanted, but I learned a lot from it and I look forward to more races in the future where I can make improvements on my training and then get better results. All right, guys, if you do have any questions about anything I covered in this video or anything I didn't mention, go ahead and drop them in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos like this in the future. If you are interested in the Movement System Endurance team, I'm always welcoming new members that are interested in structured strength training for endurance athletes. If you feel like that might be a good fit for you, go ahead and message me on Instagram at the Movement System, and I'll give you more information about it there. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.